you have your Bibles with you, you might want to turn to the book of Revelation. That's where we're camping out for these uh, several weeks together. We started last week uh, examining the beginning of the book of Revelation. We discovered that it, while it was written in Greek, the thoughts and idioms of the book of Revelation are definitely Hebrew. Some believe that the book of Revelation is just talking about events back then and is allegorical. It's just stories uh, for this time. But, however, because they failed to take a Hebraic view of the world, uh, they don't understand that mere allegory is not the nature of Jewish apocalyptic literature. Rather, that kind of literature is always predictive of the future. It's about specific historical events that will happen. In fact, the book of Revelation is history in advance. Can you say amen? It follows in the line of the Jewish ap ap apocalyptic uh, books of Daniel and Ezekiel. There's over 285 references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And so we got to get into that Hebraic mindset and say, from that vantage point, what does the book of Revelation have to say to us? We discovered last week how that revelation came to be. We understood that it is the revelation that God the Father gave to Yeshua. Yeshua, in turn, gave that revelation to his angel, and his angel brought it to John, and John testifies to what he saw, and that testimony is now something we hear. So it comes from Abba to Yeshua to the angel to John. He writes it down, testifies, and you and I are the ones who can hear and obey and chart our life according to the prophecies therein. We also discovered that when it says these things are soon to be, that that was a Greek word, uh, takos, which means quickly, quickly. It's not saying when it was written that it's going to happen next week, next year. But what it was saying, it's going to happen quickly. In other words, when it happens, things are going to unfold rapidly. There will be a, a rapid unfolding of things. And people will say, how could that have happened in such a few years. You know, one of the conditions of humanity is we tend to measure events by our own life. Forty years old, fifty years old, sixty years old, life has had a certain pace. I understand life. And, and we can live our life as if all of the understanding of humanity exists within our span of lifetime. And we fail to realize that just as short as a few generations ago, people saw things differently, acted differently, had perhaps entirely different mindsets, and that people, uh, you know, a generation down the road will think differently and have different mindsets. The only thing that changeth not is God. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and always, and His Word doesn't change. Therefore, the Bible's never irrelevant. It's never irrelevant. Though we find in today's world there are even so-called uh, born-again Christians who claim to be Bible believers, but who have gathered together with statements around the fact that the Bible is no longer practical for the decisions you need to make in today's life. I beg to differ with you. Amen? I think God has something uh, to say uh, about that. And so when we come to the book of Revelation, we realize that it's speaking of events that are going to take place and while they may seem far in the distant, I submit to you that the signs of the end times are all around us and that it doesn't take long to dismantle things that we always thought were stable. I mean, come on, we're living right within the days of that massive earthquake and, and tsunami that hit Japan. And, and what happens? I mean, in a moment, there you are going about your business. You go to work. You're in your high rise. You're, you're doing the things. You're, you're on a train going somewhere. You're, and all of a sudden, in seconds, in seconds, your world is absolutely demolished. In seconds. You know, and, and we read about those things, and they're always in distant places. And the, the nature of man is we always say, well, never me. Wouldn't happen here can't happen to me, won't happen in this place. Amen? Well, there's certain things in the Bible that will guarantee you how you can walk that out, but you better get in the will of God. Amen? And so when we read in the Bible that the day of the Lord is coming, we live in a world that even among the church, we are filled with pastors and leaders and teachers who no longer believe it. 
They don't believe there is a day of the Lord coming. Remember, this is a Jewish apocalyptic book. The Hebrew prophets are filled talking about the day of the Lord. And Revelation is about the day of the Lord and all the events that are surrounding it. History is His story and He will wrap it up in a final chapter and it will move into a millennium that He has told us very well about. Peter writes in his second epistle, uh, chapter 3, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. Come on. I mean, this, this is nuclear stuff. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. He wrote this, by the way, they didn't even understand what elements were. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? <laughs> we ought to be people who are living as if today could be the day, as if we are the generation that is going to see these things unfold. And so turn with me now in Revelation chapter 1, and let's pick up the story. That was all from what we did last week. Let's pick up in Revelation 1 at verse 12. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He fell out under the power. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Write what you've seen, what is now, and what will take place later. Now, this is John's encounter. Uh, in the, the heavenlies that he can only describe by things that he can grab an, uh, analogies to. What, did, what, was, what was his voice like? <laughs> it, was, it, it was like the sound of many waters. You know, when he spoke, what was, what was it like? It was like there was a sword coming out of his mouth. Have you, have you ever had someone speak to you sharply? Have you ever had anyone speak to you in such a way that it was like a sword cutting right into the very thought pattern of your life. There he is, and Yeshua speaks, and it's like a sword, a double-edged sword, which means it cuts both ways. He's trying to grab things to help us get an understanding, not just of a physical picture of what he saw, but of, a, of the whole emotional content of it. Amen? The imagery that we find in this passage here immediately connects us to the temple. The robe and the gold band describe the clothing of a temple priest. So what we have immediately we're plunged into, if you understand the Jewish roots of this book, immediately we're plunged into a picture of Yeshua standing among seven golden menorahs acting as a priest attending the menorahs. When, it, when, it, when Jews read this who know about the temple, that's what they're reading. Oh, there's a priest in there and he's tending the, the menorahs. And Yeshua pictures himself as the one who is tending the menorahs. We're going to find out what those menorahs are in a minute. But he's the, in a priestly role in Revelation 1. He's not a warrior in this role. He's in his priestly role. Amen? I mean, if, if you came in and, and uh, you saw me holding Avi and I'm, I'm holding him like this, you'd say, oh, yeah, he's in his Saba role. Amen? I'm being a Saba. I'm being a grandfather. You know, I'm, I'm holding him. If, if you see me there, and I'm standing there, and I got my arm around my wife, and we're standing together, and I'm pulling her close to me, ah, oh, he's in his husband role. 
Amen? I'm the same person, but I have different roles I need to fulfill. And so with Yeshua, one of his roles is he's the high priest of what? Our confession. He's the high priest of our confession. What does the high priest do? The high priest not only ministers among the menorahs, ministers there, but the high priest actually goes up into the Holy of Holies, and there he brings the needs of the people into the presence of our Heavenly Father. He is the head intercessor. He is the one who intercedes for you on your behalf. He's the high priest of your confession. That means when we confess, and it, that doesn't mean you confess sin. That's not what, it's confession in terms of what are you saying. When you're saying things that line up with God's Word, Yeshua can take those right into the presence of God and say, that's a son, that's a daughter who's saying, Abba, what you say. Amen? The accuser of the brethren wants to be a high priest of your confession. And he wants to be able to run to Abba and say, listen to what they're saying. Fear, doubt, negative. He wants to bring that so he has legal right to destroy your life. Amen? What words are we giving Yeshua in his high priestly role? That's a whole other message. We'll get to it someday. Now, all the imagery in that passage in Revelation is out of Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, in Daniel, uh, Yahweh judges from his throne with hair like wool and like snow. The Hebrew prophets uh, display Yahweh with fire coming out of his throne. The sharp two-edged sword is, again, a very familiar Old Testament image. The judgments that come are both for good and for evil. Uh, that whole imagery there is coming right out of the Tanakh, right out of the Old Testament. My goodness. And in verse 20, we read this. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let me put this in more Jewish terms. The, the seven menorahs represent the, sever, the, the seven assemblies, congregations. Amen? So seven menorahs equals seven assemblies, and what's the purpose of a menorah? To give light. What's the purpose of an assembly of God? We are to be an assembly of light. But how many people make an assembly? Well, I can't make an assembly. I'm one. And me, and my, me myself, and I don't count as three. Okay? But if Tim and I get together... We are an assembly. Yeshua said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together, there am I in the midst of it. Okay? He's what? He is the high priest of our confession. So Tim and I sit down, and we just start talking, or we're downstairs. Out. We are assembled, and Yeshua is ready to take what we're talking about and bring it before the throne of Almighty God. We better be careful what we're talking about. Did you hear about Scott? Did you hear what he did? I can't believe that he did. You know, see, that's called gossip, okay? And that becomes an assembly of darkness. See, we've got to understand, we're going to get into, when the Bible talks about don't gossip, well, you know, that's just personal thing. No, he's addressing something vital. Whenever Christians gather, we are to be an assembly of light. Thank you. We're to be menorahs. Turn to somebody and say, light up your life. <laughs> Amen. Now, the seven stars are the seven angels. If, if, if you look in, in most Bibles, you're going to find it says the seven angels. And the reason it says seven angels is because the Greek word is there is angelos, which most often can be angels. But Angelos can also be translated messenger, messenger, messenger. And if I look back in terms of what we understand of the Old Testament and the Hebrew thinking is that angels don't play a role that many people assign to these angels here. 
One would get the appearance from most commentators that the seven angels, uh, these are seven angels of the church. The challenge with that is this. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever talk about Yahweh, you know, delivering messages to the angels. The angels deliver messages. But he's going to talk here later where he says he's addressing the angel of the church. But what if it's messenger? Now, very interesting. When you look at a, at a Hebrew assembly, when the Hebrews assemble, they would assemble in a what? A shul or a synagogue, okay? In the shul or the synagogue, there would be a, a head elder leader of that uh, synagogue called a Nazi, N-A-S-I. He's the head of the elders or he's the president of the body. So when we gather together, uh, you, that, that's different than the rabbi. You are the head of the body, okay? So Mark Spicer in this congregation was the president of this assembly called a shul, okay? The Nazi is the one to whom you deliver a message you want the people to hear. So if I were to come into the shul and I have a message I want everybody to hear, I wouldn't go to another member and give them the message. I have a message I want everybody to hear. Then I got to go to the president, the Nazi, the head messenger, in Greek, the angelos of the gathering. And if, you know, if I want to, to deliver a message to one person, I wouldn't have to do that. You know, Tiffany is, is at work and she wants to get a message to Scott Malozzi and she doesn't have his number, but she knows Tim does, so she calls Tim and says, Tim, could you deliver a message to Scott? But if Tiffany came and said, I have a message, I want to give the whole church. If she went to Tim, what is he going to say? I'm not the one you come to. If you want to give it to the whole church, you got to go to pastor. He's the one that delivers the message to the whole church. And, amen. Are we on the same page? This is going somewhere. So the seven stars are the seven messengers, and there are many Hebraic messianic believers who now say the seven messengers are the seven pastors, the pastors of those churches. Wow. Now this begins to make some sense. Because a message is coming to the church. It's going to be delivered through John to the pastor of the church, who therefore as a messenger carries the message from the prophet to the church. And the messenger, in this case the pastor, is highly accountable for the message. That fits all in with what the Bible talks about, prophets and messengers and watchmen. Okay, now there's a point where you're a watchman, uh, but that's, that's another point. But, but when, when the pastor has to convey a message, that he's highly accountable to that. In fact, Yeshua says that, that you know, if you mislead people by your message, it would be better that you put a millstone around your neck and go drown yourself in the sea. Paul later will, will talk about the fact not many of you should desire to be teachers. <laughs> Why? Because there is there is amazing accountability. Why? Because you're the messenger. You're the messenger. When someone says, thus saith the Lord, it better be the Lord who's been talking. And the Bible is filled with God beginning judgment. We're going to get into this a minute. I mentioned last week, God always begins judgment in His own house. Always does. Okay? But you cannot read the, the Old Testament without finding time and time again that God begins judgment with the prophets and the priests. Prophetic office is absolutely vital in the ministry of the church, always has been in, 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 in the body of Yeshua. But prophets have exceedingly strict judgment on them. 
Come on, read your Old Testament. Prophets of Baal, they got, they got slaughtered but left and right because they were giving wrong prophecies. That doesn't mean prophecy's wrong, but it means because of the nature of the gift of prophecy, if you manipulate it by man, it misleads people, there's high accountability to that. So the message that is coming is a message that's going to the uh, seven assemblies, seven menorahs, and it's going to be delivered by, to the seven stars, the seven messengers, the pastors. Now, here's the picture that we find in the first three chapters of Revelation. And we've got to understand it. When we get beyond chapter 3, we're going to be in a, an entirely different place. We're going to get into the part of Revelation. We're going to find about end times, things that are going to happen in the world, and nations shaking and, and all that. But isn't it interesting? People talk about, you know, these plagues that are going to come, and this that's going to come, and that that's going to come, and the, and the Antichrist that's going to rise. And I mean, and, and it is going to be literally hell on earth. And people camp out at that. And don't realize that before the judgment comes to the world, it first comes to the church. That's always Yahweh's pattern. He always cleans his house before he judges the world. Now, why would that be? Why would he clean his own house before he deals with the, with the world? I mean, obviously one is, what's that? What's that? 